Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to our program, Let's Understand Islam, in which we explore many of the Islamic concepts, its ideals, and its beautiful teachings and preachings. Nahmaduhu wa nusalli wa nusallimu ala rasulihi al-kareem amma baad fa'audhu billahi min ash-shaytan al-rajim bismillahi al-rahman al-rahim wa idha sa'alaka ibadi anni fa'inni yukareeb ujibu da'wata al-da'i idha da'an falyastajibu li wal yu'minu bi la'allahum yarshudun Sadaqallahu al-azim Rabbi shrah li sadri wa yassir li amri wahlul uqdatan min lisani yafqahu qawli Ameen Assalamu alaikum once more. One of the beautiful names of Allah is Al Mujib, the one who answers, uh, the one who replies, and the one who responds. Now, for someone to answer and someone to respond, it means that they actually have heard the plea, they have heard the call, and uh, they're capable of listening to it and giving a reply back that is al-mujib allah is as-sami the listener allah hears us he hears our groaning our moaning and of course he hears our praises our singing his gl glory you know here he is all that he hears our praises and the hymns that we sing and how we glorify him he's fully aware of all that. that is Al Mujib. And you know, in Surah Ghafir, Allah says, Qala rabbukum udu'uni astajib lakum. Uh, Your Lord says, uh, Call upon me so that I will respond, so that I will answer. You know, as though you know, we are being told that you must plead, you must ask, you must seek. And why? So I want to today talk about this very beautiful practice, one of the great rituals uh, in, in, the, in the armory of a believer, uh, one of the great tools that we have in our spiritual life, which is dua or prayer. You notice today that after the, my usual khutbah and verse, I raised my hands and I did a prayer. Rabbi shrah li sadri wa yassir li amri wa hlul uqdatan min lisani yafqahu qawli. Which means that, O oh Lord, open my heart and mind so that I may be able to understand, okay? So that others may be able to understand my words. Uh, so that others can actually understand what I say. Rabbi shrah li sadri, open my heart and mind, so that I may be able to speak so eloquently and so elegantly and effectively so that others can then yafqahu qawli, so that they can understand my words. This was a prayer of Musa alayhi salam. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commissioned Musa alayhi salam to go to Pharaoh, Musa alayhi salam complained, Ya Allah, um, you know, uh, I, uh, I am tongue-tied sometimes uh, and uh, I, I can't speak clearly sometimes. Uh, and Allah says to him, go Musa and make this prayer. So Musa salam makes this prayer asking Allah to open his heart and mind so that he can speak eloquently and clearly to Pharaoh and invite him to the way of God. So we see that, you know, the Anbiya prayed to Allah. But what is dua? What is the prayer? Here is a very terse and a beautiful definition of dua from one of the great uh, commentators of hadith, Muhammad ibn Ulan, the commentator of Riyadh al-Salihin. And he says that the, the glorious Quran uses the word dua for a variety of meanings, for devotion, seeking help, asking for something, and calling and praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Imam Fakhruddin Razi, uh, in his great um, work, the Tafsir Kabir, says that it is the pleading of the servant to the Almighty, majestic Lord, for his support, help, and for him to provide him his sustenance. So you can see that it's about seeking sustenance, help, provision, calling upon Allah, um, getting in touch with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
And in spiritual context, dua really refers to that sincere call, the earnest appeal and the humble request which the worshipper makes to his almighty majestic Lord. This call and sincere plea could be for help at a time of difficulty or for divine benevolence to shower mercy or merely for consolation and peace of mind. This gives the devout a sense of self-assurance, boosts his self-confidence and makes one feel skewer. What priceless gem is this in our turbulent times? Is it any wonder that the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam called the Dua Ad-Dua'u Mukhul Ibada? The prayer, this Dua, you know, this raising of hands and pouring your heart to the Lord and seeking His help. He says, this is the very essence of worship. This is the brains of worship. This is the kernel of worship. You know, this is the very real Worship. This is what worship is. And I want to just explore this uh, hadith of Rasulullah, you know, that this is the kernel, this is the essence of worship. You know, so what he's saying is that um, the, the, the dua has this element of the verbal side of it, you know, where you say, oh, Rabbana taqabbal minna, okay, oh, Rabbi rahamhuma, oh, Allah have mercy on me, Allahumma inni, oh, Allah I ask, Allahumma inni as'aluka, I ask you, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika, oh, Allah I seek your protection and so on. So there is this verbal utterance. And then, you know, there is something else that must accompany a true prayer and true dua. And that is really when we begin to, um, you know, do tafakkur or contemplation. When we really begin to think deeply about what we are asking for. And in this deep state of prayer, the Prophet ﷺ called it a state of devotion like no other. When he said that, لا عبادة كتفكر لا عبادة كتفكر There is no ibadah, there is no worship like tafakkur, like this deep contemplation, deep thinking, deep sort of reflections. As one reflects in the creation, one is overcome with awe, joy, and one's faith really blooms. One faith becomes, one's faith becomes strong, that there is, there is an outpouring of conviction. Oh Lord, you haven't made any of this purposeless and valueless. رَبَّنَا مَا خَلَقْتَ هَذَا بَاطِلَ سُبْحَانَكْ فَقِنْ عَذَابَ النَّارِ You know, when you begin to have that deep reflection as the Qur'an describes, you know, it, de it describes the thoughtful believer that when he reflects on things around him and, and he sees the beauty of nature, he sees these wonderful scenes, he sees the melody and the cacophony of the songs of the birds. What does he come to? The conclusion he comes to is, رَبَّنَا مَا خَلَقْتَ هَذَا بَاطِلَ These celestial bodies, O Lord, these constellations of stars, these mighty suns, this beautiful moon, this beautiful world of yours, O Allah, you haven't made this without a purpose, without a meaning. Yes, it has meaning. And, you know, this is the... This is the state of reflection. This is the state where, you know, we are contemplating and we say, Rabbana ma khalaqta hadha batl. Oh, Lord, you haven't made this purposeless. In the state of enlightenment, this is really a state of enlightenment. There is a greater ease and a, con and, and, and a condor in now petitioning the Lord. Okay? We are more open to sharing our emotions more freely with the Lord. This is the third form of prayer, the personal petition, du'a. This is the, the mark of the true humiliation. It is the pure and selfless love of God, a longing to be close and near to Him. Okay? During this deep state of prayer, we can sometimes sense ourselves standing in the divine presence. Described by Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, ka'annaka tara fa'illam tukun tarahu fa'innahu yaraak. You are as though you are worshipping God as though you are seeing Him. You are worshipping God as though you are actually seeing Him. What a wonderful state to be in actually, you know, when we're in that state. So we move from the verbal, the words into that reflective mode where we are then taken into the divine presence. That is dua, that is the prayer. And I'll share with you some of the prayers of the Anbiya, the prophets of God. 
But before we do that, let us just once more, you know, sort of reflect on the significance of prayer. In one place, uh, Allah challenges the believers and he says to them, قُلْ مَا يَعْبَأُ بِكُمْ رَبِّي لَوْ لَا دُعَاءُكُمْ فَقَدْ قَزَّبْتُمْ لِسْ uh, and, and, you know, Allah says, O oh Muhammad, say to them, what has the Lord to do with you if you do not call upon him? What has the Lord to do with you if you don't call upon him? What does that mean? In other words, Allah is not bothered with you if you can't be bothered to do your du'as and prayers to him. You know, prayer is so important. You know, du'a, seeking, you know, from Allah, devoutly is so important. Uh, once a Bedouin came to the Prophet وسلم, and he says to him, Ya Rasulullah, tell me, where is my Lord? Is he near so that I can talk to him silently and privately and I can confide in him? Or is he far away that I have to uh, shout and talk loudly to him? When this Bedouin, in his innocent manner, asked this question. This verse was revealed according to some Mufassireen. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم وإذا سألك عبادي عني فإني قريب O oh, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam When my servant asks you about me, where am I? Tell him, I am near, inni kareeb. I will respond, I will answer his question, I will answer his pleading, I will answer his begging, whatever he asks for, whenever and wherever, when and wherever he asks, I will respond to that. And therefore, you too should respond and listen to us, okay, so that you may be guided. I think this is a really a very, very powerful verse with regards to making du'as, with regards to asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I've translated the uh, thoughts of Imam Fakhruddin Razi uh, from his beautiful work you know, in his tafsir -e kabir He's commented on this verse in this way. And I, I want to give you this beautiful, um, I, I think it's a very beautiful f uh, summary and description of what is du'a in Islam really. Imam Fakhruddin Razi gives a mastery rebuttal to the challenge that these questions raise. You know, the question that, um, you know, um, is, is, if our du'a is not answered, so what is the purpose of making du'a? Why should we pray when our du'as are almost, you can say, rarely answered or I don't feel they're answered. So he says, you know, how do you answer that? A uh, huge uh, allegation really and, 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 uh, uh, and, and uh, question. How do you answer that? And he says that he begins by mentioning the, you know, the circumstances in which this verse was revealed, which I've just explained to you, you know, where Allah says, you know, I am near. And Imam Razi then continues by saying that some ignorant people claim dua is something without benefits. You know, some ignorant people, he says, refuse to accept the benefits of dua. And he goes on to say, uh, and they argue, if something will happen, then it will happen anyway. If something is not to happen, then it wouldn't happen. So then what is the need for the dua? Allah knows what man needs. So this is, you know, he says, this is one of the questions the ignorant people ask. Allah, the Almighty, is the knower of all secrets. So what is the need of dua? Again, he knows what man needs. He then says, if the object of dua is benefit of man, then why, does, why doesn't the most generous give it without us, without asking? Why do we have to ask him? Why do we have to beg? Why do we have to plead? Why do we have to keep on repeating again and again our du'as to him? Why? The fourth reason it says, it is well established fact that text and reason uh, that the highest station of piety is being satisfied with the divine will. And du'a negates this. When one is requesting and preferring one's own wishes over div divine will. So, you know, this is quite a powerful uh, question, isn't it? You know, we should really reconcile with divine will, whatever God wants. You know, why are we, um, you know, asking when we should accept whatever divine will is? 
Uh, dua is like making a command or a prohibition. And that for man, with regards to his Lord, is of course blasphemous. <laughs> you know, this is another uh, argument. And then he says, the Messenger وسلم, said, Allah says, whoever is kept from asking me because of my zikr, I shall give him better than those who ask. They say, in light of these arguments, it is better not to make a dua. So this is the argument of those ignorant people, Razi says, who say, why, why bother making the dua? However, Imam Razi strongly rejects this view, and he says, the overwhelming majority of scholars regard dua as the key to all worships. Okay? It is the mukhul ibadah. It is the essence of worship. It is the salahul mu'min. It, it is the weapon of the believer. He discusses the excellence of dua and says, in dua, there is no intermediary between man and the Lord. It is a direct dialogue, a direct communication with you and the Lord of the universe. Therefore, you know, you really need to be focusing on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, you know, I, I could go on what he's explaining, but what I want to do very quickly is this. I just want to share some of the du'as of the prophets in the last few minutes of this program. Here is a du'a that Ibrahim alayhi salam, as soon as he had built the Kaaba, what does he do? Well, he turns to his Lord. He's built the Kaaba with Ismail, and as though he's saying, uh, Oh Lord, give me my wage now. I've done my work. What does he say? He says, Rabbana taqabbal minna, inna ka anta samiul alim. Oh Lord, accept what we have offered you. Accept this from us. And uh, you are the hearer and the listener. Uh, and then, of course, he goes on making a very wonderful dua. Dua for his children. And, you know, this seems to be something very unique to the prophets. They pray for themselves and they pray for their children. Here is a great sunnah of the prophets. So let us, inshallah, all of us pray for our children and, of course, for our parents as well. Uh, and then he prays. He prays, Rabbana waj'alna muslimain. Allah, make me and my son a true submitters, true devotees of yours. And then he prays, Rabbana wa basfihim rasoola. O Lord, also send amongst them a wonderful prophet from my children. And I want you to raise a great prophet, the prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa who will be the master of all prophets, the leader of mankind. I want you to send, I hope you can see you know, how you know, prayer for one's children. Then, of course, there is that wonderful prayer of the righteous people, which is Rabbana hablana min azwajina wa dhurriyatina qurrata ayun wajalna lil muttaqina imama. O Lord, give us coolness of our eye, delight from our children and our family, and make us the, the imam, the leaders of the pious people. What a powerful dua. And then Ibrahim again here praying, Rabbi ja'alni muqib as-salat wa min dhurriyyati. Oh Allah, make me a, one who devotes himself in the prayer. And also make my children people who pray. And subhanAllah, you know, we can go on and on. You know, where the, the Anbiya, the Prophets, make prayers of all kind. You know, let's end with one very powerful prayer, which is, O Rabbana, فِرْ لَنَا وَلِإِخْوَانِنَا الَّذِينَ سَبَقُونَ بِالْإِيمَانِ وَلَا تَجْعَلْ فِي قُلُوبِنَا غِلًّا لِلَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَرَبَّنَا إِنَّكَ رَؤُوفٌ رَحِيمٌ O oh Lord, forgive us and forgive our brothers who have passed before us. Okay? And remove any kind of malice and hatred that is in our hearts for them. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you know, make us people who are prayerful to Allah. Why? Because walam akum bidwa'ika rabbi shaqiyya. Our Lord never, you know, never rejects our prayers. The Prophet وسلم, said, when you pray, one of the three things happens. Either your prayer is granted or some calamity or difficulty is diverted. And finally, if you don't see any effect here, certainly on the Day of Judgment, it will come to you as a great blessing. In fact, there is another hadith which says that people you know, will see their um, rewards and their deeds and they will not recognize many of them. And they will ask the angels, what is this? I never did this. And the angels will say, do you remember? You prayed. You made a dua which wasn't granted there. This is the reward for it. Let us be people who pray to Allah.
because prayer really shows that we are connected, that we have a direct relationship with Allah, we communicate with Him. Rabbana taqabbal minna inna ka anta sabiul alim. Rabbana zalamna anfusana wa illam taghfil lana wa tarhamna lanakunanna minil khasirin. Wa akhiru da'wana anilhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Allah